Well, we've both been pretty busy over the last few weeks. We've managed to completely rebuild the rudder, fix a few serious structural issues, and strip the whole hull in preparation for copper coating. Ready? Yeah, go! Now that the rudder's finally back on, I just want to make a few tweaks to the shape before we can carry on prepping the hull. I did originally have the idea of referring the rudder shape to a template from a printed profile, but this idea went out the window as the original shape's too far removed from any foil I could find. However, I still wanted to be able to improve the angle of attack by rounding out the leading edge, and also to try and shallow the taper out and square off that trailing edge. The idea of this being able to improve the laminar flow and reduce any turbulence that may potentially cause rudder vibration. I used the foil pattern I already had and a few calculations as a guide to give me an indication as to how to reshape that leading edge and how best I could improve the trailing edge. I knew it was perhaps a bit of overkill, but there was no negative effect that I knew of by doing so. And as we'd done so much with it already, it made sense to go the extra mile and just do it anyway. I covered a piece of timber in clear tape so the epoxy wouldn't stick to it and clamped it to the trailing edge and built this out using epoxy thickened with a high density filler. I've built the edge out longer than it actually needs to be here. This is so I can shallow the taper towards the end and then cut it flush once it's cured. The filler's going back up both sides and this will be more than strong enough to bond around the end. Once it's all hardened I reclamp the wood further forward to be able to use it as a straight edge. The excess is trimmed off with the multi-tool to form a square edge and that's what I'm looking for to reduce that potential rudder vibration. Okay, so this is a really handy and super simple tool that you can make that makes sanding curves go a whole lot easier. It's just a thin strip of plywood with a couple of wooden blocks attached as handles and I use spray on contact adhesive to stick lengths of sandpaper to it. It makes a great flexible surface for following the contours over a hull and it allows you to create a shallow curve and keep things nice and even without creating any flat spots. I'm just tidying up the surface a little before making a start on fairing it. Hopefully you can see here how the trailing edge is now a nice even taper and it's squared off. While I was wrapping the rudder in fiberglass matting, I already added several layers of fiberglass onto this leading edge to try and build it up and increase the angle of the curve, as originally it was a very flat profile and less than optimal. I've already built the leading edge up some more and allowed it to cure, and now I just need to even that curve out. And I continue to add more thickened epoxy here, as I'm trying to increase that angle even further. As the size of the curvature narrows from top to bottom, I can't easily make a template to profile this shape. And as just about everything else about this wood has been done using the Mark 1 eyeball, that's what I'm using again now. I've simply used a flexible sheet of plastic here, and I keep it squeezed to the sides as I slide it down, and this does a really good job of keeping that curve angle nice and even as the rudder tapers towards the bottom. And that's as good as it gets before we start fairing. Before I start with that fairing compound though, I'm applying a layer of epoxy to the keel first. In the last video you'll have seen how we prepped the keel and finished it by sanding with a 60 grit pad on the orbital sander. Just to point out here that that sanding was only done the day previously to this. Although the keel's solid lead and it doesn't rust, lead does oxidise very quickly and that layer of oxidisation will form a loose layer and potentially cause anything we put over the top of it to not bond properly and flake off. So I'm getting this done today before it has time to react. The epoxy resin that I'm using here is another West System product called G-Flex and it's a slightly more flexible and elastic version of their epoxy and it's what they recommend for applying directly to bare metal before fairing. So what you do with this, just getting a coating on it? Yeah. 
just getting a coating on this so I can put the fairing, so I can put the fairing on it. I also used a slightly thickened version of this to fill in the shallow groove I ground into the whole keel joint. The fairing compound I'm using is simply another version of thickened epoxy and this time I'm using West System 407 low density filler. I could have used their Microlite filler that would have been easier to sand smooth but I opted for this as it would give me better impact resistance. All I'm trying to achieve here is to smooth out the lumps and bumps of the existing shape. I'm not trying to reprofile the shape at all. This tool I'm using is just a rubber squeegee from the local hardware shop. Have you done it a bit looser to the mix this one? Yeah, it looks a lot looser. Is it easier to work with? Looks it. The following day, once it's all hardened, it's back to more hand sanding with that flexible board. This is harder work than using the sander, but it does ensure a smoother contour without any flat spots. Trying to get underneath the keel to prep it was a bit of a pain, but unfortunately there was not a lot else we could have done, and we just had to do the best we could manage to get it clean. That's us, almost ready to start painting. After a quick wipe down we can get the waterline taped up. I'm using masking tape and following the original line to the top of the lower boot stripe. This is where it had been previously anti-fouled to and that's where we'll be painting to also as the original waterline was way too low and I can't see how this was ever above the water even with an empty boat. Where you can see the green and grey paint this is an existing epoxy barrier coat. There were four coats in total previously, but as we've prepped the hull, we've sanded some of this back and so we're going to put another two coats of epoxy barrier coat over this and two coats on the keel. And all of the other bare or unpainted areas under the waterline, we're going to be painting with four coats in total. The paint that's already on is International Gel Shield and that's the product that we'll be using too. I'm overlapping two layers of masking tape here so I can stagger the edge a little. Even though the paint's quite thin, by the time we've added layers of copper coat over the top too, I don't want a lip of paint that's going to get damaged easily. 
So, you may well ask, why on earth are you barrier coating a lead keel that's already fared with epoxy and you're going to be putting an epoxy based coating over the top of it too? Well, this is because as you mix the fairing compound, you introduce air into it. And even though I tried to eliminate this, it still will be susceptible to some pinholes from small bubbles. And I know that these unfilled pinholes will cause the copper coat to blister. So as the barrier coat's quite thin, this will hopefully fill in these holes and means I won't have to drill and fill any pinholes that might otherwise appear in the copper coat. So that's all the bare areas painted, now for two more coats over the rest of the hull. We need to get all this done in one go today, so it looks as though it's going to be a late night. Epoxy doesn't like damp conditions, but the temperature's still warm and the humidity's low, so there shouldn't be anything to worry about painting in the dark. One important thing to note here is, even though the barrier paint and the copper coat we're going to be applying are both technically epoxy based, they are fundamentally quite different as the copper coat resin is actually a water based product and copper coat warn that any vapour from another type of coating that you're applying to will potentially react with the copper coat. So unfortunately this means we have to wait four days for the barrier coat to fully cure before we can paint over it. I did notice a little bubble in the keel fairing that needed to be drilled and filled. Once we were sure this was fully cured, we lightly sanded over the whole hull with 120 grit pad to give it a good key and washed and wiped everything down ready to start with a copper coat early the following day. This is what 1,100 pounds worth of copper coat looks like. We'd calculated for the five coats we planned on applying, we needed 11 packs to cover the area under the waterline. Each pack consists of a 500 milliliter tub of resin, a 500 milliliter bottle of hardener, and a two kilo bag of very fine copper powder. We also got a couple of bottles of isopropyl alcohol that's used as a thinners. <laughs> 
we laid everything out we were going to need ready on the table. Like with all epoxy resins you need to apply each coat over the top of the next while it's still tacky. Though with this, if it's applied while the previous coat's still too wet, you'll just lift that previous layer right off with the roller. Apply it when it's too late and it's dried too far and it won't bond properly and it'll lightly blister. And we need to make sure we get all five coats done in one day. There was only going to be two of us doing the painting, so by the time we finish one coat, it should be tacky enough for us to start the next. The mixing process is pretty straightforward and we're only going to be mixing full mixes so we don't need to weigh anything out. The only thing that needs any measuring is the thinners and a data sheet says to use three capfuls per full pack which is approximately 5% of the volume. I added the copper powder in in three lots so it mixed in nice and evenly. It's also important to note that once it's mixed you need to constantly stir it while it's in the roller tray and every time you add more to the tray from the bucket as the copper's heavy and it sinks to the bottom very quickly. If you don't do this you'll waste a lot of copper and end up with uneven coverage. It was around 25 degrees the day that we did this and the working time of the mix was only about 20 minutes before it started to thicken too much and we could no longer roller it on so there was no hanging around once we'd mixed the pack. We started to roller it on from the bow towards the stern and then repeated this for every layer we did. We'd watched several videos of it being applied before we started the process and so we knew that that first layer was going to look very thin and patchy and as you can see it most certainly did. As we added each subsequent layer though, it starts to look better and better. It took us both around 6 hours to do the job from start to finish. A couple of days later once the copper coat had hardened enough we moved the pads on the cradle that supports the boat and did the patches underneath that we'd missed. So what made us decide to do this when we could have just slapped some more anti-fouling paint over the top? <laughs> 
Well, we were planning to strip off all the old antifoil anyway, as we wanted to epoxy below the waterline to protect from osmosis. So, we were already going to have a nice clean hull, and we knew that most of the hard work involved in doing this was going to be in the preparation. So, if we were going to do it, now was definitely going to be the right time. Even though we do get Hirith lifted out of the water regularly, we wouldn't have to get lifted to re antifoil every two years. And as I'm inherently lazy, this seemed like a good enough reason on its own to be fair. We'd also calculated that the overall cost of a copper coat was roughly four times more expensive than a good quality antifoul paint. But if we reapplied antifoul paint every two years, that's the same cost in eight years, and the copper coat should last ten, so there was a potential long-term saving there. And importantly for us was that we wanted to minimise creating any potentially environmentally hazardous waste. We didn't want to use an antifoul containing chemical biocides, and there are antifoul paints available that only contain copper as the active ingredient. But even those paints leach that copper and the paint into the water, and they need to be removed and reapplied regularly. The copper in the copper coat is non-leaching, as it's held in place with the epoxy. And also, it's another layer of epoxy that's on the hull, that's a hydrophobic barrier to protect against osmosis. Anyway, I'm not trying to sell you anything here, I'm just letting you know our thought process for what we did and when we did it. We did find a few pinholes that needed filling in, but on the whole it wasn't too bad. When you mix the copper powder into the resin, it coats the particles and it's held in suspension in the mix as you apply it. So as it hardens there's a layer of resin over the surface of this copper powder. And now we need to remove this thin layer of resin and expose the copper powder to the surface. So once the copper coat had fully hardened, we abraded over the whole thing with the scotch bright pad attached to the orbital sander. Once the resin is dry, it leaves a material percentage of 80% copper on the surface of the hull, and it's this copper that once exposed and in the water, quickly oxidises and acts as a very effective anti-fouling. You can see the difference in colour here once we've exposed the copper underneath that surface layer of epoxy. While we were researching this, we'd seen videos and read stories of people applying copper coat, and it unfortunately not being that successful for them. But copper coat's basically just a way of keeping copper being exposed on the outside of the hull, and sailors have been successfully using copper as an anti-fouling coating on boats for over 350 years. If you stick to the recommended directions, there's not a lot to go wrong. You've just seen it's not a difficult process. So, for anyone that's watching this that's considering giving it a go, after doing it ourselves, we'd simply recommend avoiding the common pitfalls, which are not preparing and fully cleaning the substrate correctly not applying it within the temperature and humidity parameters that are specified on the data sheet. This is very important. Not keeping it mixed properly while rolling it on. And not exposing the copper enough once it's been cured. Well, that's us, ready to go back in the water. And after being in the boatyard far too long, we were more than ready to move on. It was without a doubt hard work, and we definitely ended up doing a lot more than we anticipated originally. But we were happy that the rudder and the bearing tube were now much stronger than ever before, and it's peace of mind to know that it's been done. The good weather we've been treated to took a turn for the worse over the next week, but the night before we were due to leave, we were treated to an evening of quite a spectacular thunderstorm. The following morning the skies had cleared and we made our way back out through the bridge and back out into the North Sea, ready for the next stage of Hirad's journey. <laughs>